Good afternoon. I guess my job is to wake you up from the artificial intelligence dream. Some time ago, Martin Schulz said we need to fight for freedom against technological totalitarianism. And so what was he talking about? Well, we're certainly living in an age of big data. Within just one minute, we're sending 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts, and as we move or go shopping, that creates data traces and altogether big data. Big data we can use for all sorts of good things, and Chris Anderson had that dream if you just had enough data, then science wouldn't anymore be needed. Basically, the truth would reveal itself and tell us what to do. And of course, people say knowledge is power, so governments have started to collect a lot of data and also companies as well. And the dream was to build something like a crystal ball, a machine that would be able to see what's going on in the world in any place in real time and also predict the future. And in fact, militaries around the world are working on this. And it's not only built on big data, but also on artificial intelligence. So computational power is exponentially exploding. According to Moore's law, it is doubling every 18 months. And in about 20 years' time, if not earlier, experts expect that we would have computers more capable than human brains. And in fact, what we can expect is that intelligent machines will start to be our tools. And then, as they get more intelligent, they will be like teammates and then coaches. And eventually, will they be our bosses? That's the question. And in fact, uh, there's research going on on this. And if we think further about it, then the question is, would so much intelligence enable a benevolent dictator? Or a wise king? And in fact, Facebook has these imperial ambitions. And not only Facebook, in fact, IBM Watson was proposed for president. And Google wants to reprogram the state. That means we have companies and governments that are trying to come up with an operating system for society, not for computers not for smartphones, an operating system for society and for what you're doing. So could society be run like a giant machine? You know, if you put big data and artificial intelligence and Internet of Things and all of this together and took a hundred billion dollars, you know, could we run society like a giant machine? And for this, we would need to know what are all the pieces. That means uh, you and me and everyone else and all the companies and political parties and so on. And we would need to figure out what they're doing and how they can be manipulated. Now, in fact, people are trying to build such a machine. And it's built on deep learning, on machine learning that would use all those data that have been collected about each and every one of us. And in this way, these algorithms would figure out what we're doing and how we can be manipulated. And Google was one of the first companies to learn this, how to basically steer our attention with personalized information. And with this also, our decisions, our opinions, our emotions, and our behaviors at least to some extent. You know, they're trying to make us click certain links and buy certain products. And in fact, that's becoming interesting also for politics, where we talk about liberal paternalism, but that's kind of misleading. It's really about making people do certain kind of things using personal data that you've probably not agreed to share for that purpose. And so the question is, you know, how well does this remote control work? If you look at people, at pictures like this, you would think, oh, maybe there's something to it. And if it doesn't work well enough, there is still the citizen score, which is being tested in some countries. And basically gives you plus and minus points depending on what you're doing in real life 
or on the internet, what you're clicking, what you're buying, uh, what your friends and neighbors and family members are doing, all of that will influence your citizen score and determine what kind of jobs you can have and what countries you will be able to visit. So this is a pretty totalitarian approach apparently, and so that's why I'm warning, we may lose what we build over hundreds of years, which means freedom and self-determination, human dignity, uh, pluralism, democracy, participation, a lot of things. So now there's now the possibility, no question, with all the data we have to build a feudalism 2.0, a layered society or a fascism 2.0, a big brother or a brave new world society, or communism 2.0, like a benevolent dictatorship. And I guess nobody would want this to happen. So we need to say stop, stop this, because we really need to worry about that. And there are a number of books that I can recommend you to read, such as the program Tumen, uh, the formula to rule the world, uh, the end of democracy, the smart dictatorship, and even those people who have actually spoken up in favor of nudging in the beginning start to get worried, such as Cass Sunstein. So how did we get here into this scary scenario? And in fact, the problem is lack of sustainability. You know, we learned that actually a couple of decades ago, Limit to Growth by the Club of Rome has opened our eyes. The shocking thing was that the prediction was that there was no scenario for this planet which didn't end in a collapse of the economy and uh, population collapse. And this Global 2000 report of uh, Bill Clinton's uh, government was actually coming to similar conclusions. In fact, the Pentagon is expecting mass civil breakdown and also the United Nations uh, are worried and that's why they came up with the Sustainable Development Agenda, giving us 15 years to solve our problems. In fact, now overusing resources in industrial countries basically implies that there's a lack of resources elsewhere and it produces conflict and war and mass migration, terrorism and all these things that we worry about now. So we really need to fix this problem. And this is the fix that some people have proposed, Bentham Sponopticum. Basically, if we're running short on resources, then we need really to decide who gets how much of what kind of resource. Who will still get a flu shot? Who will get medicine? Who is allowed to eat meat? Who gets how much food? And so on. It will be measured exactly how much you eat of what resource. And and so on and so on, you know, and these systems, um, they do exist. Now, the worry is that all these technologies will also be misused. So there's always a dual use problem. And in fact, uh, there's a possibility really to manipulate people in a serious way, social bots, it has been noticed, are endangering the internet as we know it because they can mislead us. And we've ended up in what we now call a fact-free world. This is a side effect of all those technologies. In fact, uh, Barack Obama, who's supposed to be the most powerful man in the world, has warned us that this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideas of liberal democracies are under attack. And when notions of objectivity and of a free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. So what a world when the most powerful person in the world cannot control it any longer. We lost control of those systems. In fact, uh, it seems like social bots have been also playing an important role in this Brexit decision and that actually also shook the markets and was a pretty expensive experience. I'm saying with Albert Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. We need a different kind of thinking, a paradigm shift, and we need to understand that we are living in a complex world 
And even though computational processing power is exploding exponentially and data volume even faster, as we go on networking the world, that creates combinatorial opportunities and so systemic complexity is exploding even faster. Even though we have the best technology of all times and more data than ever, we are about to lose control, top-down control. We need a new control paradigm, distributed control, because we're now living in a heavily networked world. And so that means that the intended effect will, in many cases, not happen, but we'll have side effects, we'll have feedback effects, we'll have cascade effects. And that's why society cannot be steered like a car. Because the interactions of cars is actually leading to undesirable outcomes, such as phantom traffic jams that um, happen even though nobody wants them to happen. On the contrary, and even mass surveillance wouldn't help. But there is something that helps, which is changing the interaction mechanism. I probably don't have enough time to play the full video over here. We'll find it on the internet, and what it's showing is first a simulation of the stop and go traffic that we've seen before, so we understand it. There is some mathematics behind it. And then basically what we do is we equip cars with radar sensors that measure distances and relative velocities and let the cars drive in an automatic way, slightly different from humans. So we change the interaction mechanism, but we don't assume to have a traffic control center. It's only that we change the interactions and that uh, eventually actually allows to get rid of the traffic jam. I'll wait for these few seconds. So um, we'll say in, in a moment, and now it's saying we're turning on the system, and we'll see that we'll get rid of the traffic jam. So we managed to stabilize the traffic flow and increase capacity. And how are we doing this? Basically by introducing feedback loops that respond to real-time data in such a way that self-organization would set in and produce a favorable outcome. And complexity science knows how to choose interactions in such a way that this would happen like magic, like an uh, invisible hand steering and coordinating things. And we can do that actually on multiple levels in this way, create a better world, but with freedoms to be creative and innovative, which is completely different from that top-down control system. And uh, a proclaimed optimization approach that uh, I've explained before in the scary part of my talk. And in fact, uh, the very same decentralized self-organization approach has also been applied for urban areas um, when traffic flows are allowed to control the traffic lights rather than the other way around. We get much more efficient outcomes if we do it the right way, so interactions are selected the right way, and that's good for all the traffic participants and the environment. In fact, such decentralized approaches are also getting more popular in electricity grids, such as smart grids, and so on. Now, as we're living in a world that is too complex for anyone to fully understand, including super intelligent systems, we really need to learn how to bring the knowledge and ideas of many minds together, be it people or artificial intelligence systems. That means enable collective intelligence. And this requires something like online liberation platforms. That means virtual tables on which people can place their arguments and then we could start basically to sort them into different perspectives on a complex problem. And once that has been done, we can have a round table to create innovative integrated solutions. And in fact, it turns out that these solutions are often much better than the best individual approach. A very nice example is the Netflix challenge. Have a look at the corresponding Wikipedia page. And it shows you that combining individual solutions 
will improve the outcome, even as compared to the best individual solution. That means diversity wins, not the best. And that means in order to create a better world, we need to employ value pluralism, not just maximize efficiency, but also take into account other dimensions that are important for society and economy to work well. In fact, the point is really to enable combinatorial innovation. The other thing that we need besides is democracy 2.0 is capitalism 2.0, and in particular, a new financial system that I call finance 4.0. And I think now with technology such as the Internet of Things and blockchain technology, if combined with complexity science, we can finally build an efficient, liberal, and participatory social, democratic, and ecological economic system. And in fact, what we need to do in order to overcome the resource crisis that we are heading towards is to build a circular economy that means to reuse the limited resources and also the sharing economy will be very important for this to achieve that actually we can offer a high quality of life to more people with less resources and less wars and less other problems and in fact we're working on a concept study it's called NervousNet it's a platform that I'd like to, uh, you to participate in terms of uh, producing data, but also code. It's an open source platform that's using smartphones and other Internet of Things sensors in order to measure the world around us and network those devices to build a global measurement system that would be run as a citizen web. I mean, it's managed by all of us together, a little bit like Wikipedia in a sense. And then we could actually measure externalities, as economists would say. I mean, the external effects of interaction between people and companies and the environment could measure noise and CO2 and poisonous um, stuff and also waste. And we could also measure positive things such as cooperation and happiness and education and new jobs and reuse of resources and basically build an incentive system, a multidimensional incentive system on top of this in order really to a reward uh, social and ecological production and behavior and uh, in order to reward the circular economy. So it would be the, uh, emerging based on market principles. And it's now possible actually to create such a system. And as we would all in a crowdsourced way measure externalities and share these data with others, uh, a basis for this new economy to come, uh, we would also earn money, different kinds of money, in fact. Uh, so money would be created in a bottom-up way, this pumping trillions of dollars into the system by the Fed or ECB doesn't work, we know this. And we could also create actually taxes in this way. So I think now we will see a triple transformation, digital, ecological, and financial, and that can solve our problems. Thank you very much. Let's do that together. <laughs>